another minute as people start to uh, come on in and sit down. We have, so far we have uh, 145 people, 146 people attendees, and there's 15 panelists here with you all. And we still have people coming in. Amber, it's good to see you. Kevin. We're gonna give it just a few more seconds. Okay, so we've got uh, about 150 people in and the numbers are slowing down. We are recording this, so everybody should know that. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Hello everyone, welcome to our community update. I'm Cindy Vosberg, Crescent City Del Norte Chamber of Commerce Executive Director. This is probably the most sober and important meeting I have ever been a part of. Our community is devastated by COVID right now. Our businesses are closing or reducing hours and services. Our community members are sick and some are even dying. We all know someone who is sick or in the hospital. And just this week, we lost our beautiful and greatly loved real estate agent, Mitzi Travis to COVID. Mitzi, so full of life and grace, died this week of COVID. I don't know the number of times I have quoted Mitzi while I was writing an article or being interviewed by a travel writer on our region. Mitzi had once told me why she and I were talking about the lack of traffic on our freeway north of town. Mitzi said, what's not to love about Del Norte County? We have bumper to bumper beauty. That was such a great quote, bumper to bumper beauty in Del Norte County. Well, right now, Del Norte County needs to pull together to solve this critical issue we are facing. And I want you to know that the Chamber of Commerce is here for you. And we continue to do everything we can to help our business community and everyone else through this time. And I wanna thank Senator Mike McGuire for helping us coordinate this meeting. Senator McGuire cares about us and works hard to help us through our challenges. He has been in Del Norte twice over the last month and has seen firsthand the crisis we are facing. And I also want to announce that for the next two weeks after this week, we're gonna hold meetings just like this on Thursday at six o'clock. So please plan as we deal with this crisis to be here with us. I'll hand the meeting off to him now. Thank you, Senator, for being here. Well, good evening, Cindy. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna take a moment to say thank you to Cindy. Thank you for kicking us off tonight. You're absolutely right. This is a sobering evening tonight for all of us in Del Norte County. But on behalf of each of us who are part of this panel, we wanna say thank you to Cindy in the Del Norte County Chamber of Commerce for your tireless work on behalf of the small business community here, uh, not just in the county, but of, of course, Crescent City as well. Thank you, Cindy, and for your leadership. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to be able to work with each and every one of you representing Del Norte, as well as the North Coast in the State Senate. And we're thankful that each of you have taken time out of your busy schedules to be able to attend this important community meeting. We have several hundred folks who are tuning in tonight. And I got to say, there hasn't been a more critical meeting for our community in decades. Tonight, we're going to come together to talk about the alarming surge due to the prevalence of the highly infectious Delta variant here in Del Norte County. We're going to be discussing the facts that we see on the ground. We're going to answer your questions here tonight. We're going to hopefully dispel any myths that may be out there. Uh, and we're going to talk about this very real public health crisis and how every level of government is working together seamlessly to deliver for the patients in need here in Del Norte. As you know, there's been a rapid increase in COVID-19 cases here in Del Norte County. This uptick is a consequence of the Delta variant and the low vaccination rate that we have in our region. The Delta variant is the predominant strain of COVID-19 the COVID-19 virus in the United States and right here on the North Coast. It's causing more infections and spreading more quickly compared to earlier forms of the virus. I wanna transition to talk about how this virus is impacting 
all of us in Del Norte County right now. Tonight, there are 36 patients at Sutter Coast Hospital. That's nearly double the norm for this time this year. 23 patients of the 36 are COVID positive. And I wanna be blunt. We believe the worst of this public health crisis is still to come over the next two to four weeks. That's when we could potentially expect a peak in cases. 10 patients. 10 patients have died from the coronavirus at the hospital this week. In the last 24 hours, four neighbors, four of our neighbors have died at the hospital due to the coronavirus. We believe that this is an undercount of the virus in deaths. There are more that we believe have died outside of the hospital in the community pending further investigation. I wanna put that into perspective. The great 1964 tsunami killed 11 neighbors in Crescent City. It was the worst disaster that we've seen in modern history here in Crescent City and Del Norte County. Right now, COVID cases are up 98% in Del Norte over the last two weeks. And as of today, just about 43% of Del Norte residents have been fully vaccinated. Fortunately, that vaccination rate is up compared to where we were just a week ago, but we're lagging the statewide average, which is at 68% vaccinated. I just wanna be honest, this latest surge, it's totally avoidable. It's a surge mostly among the unvaccinated. And I don't wanna talk politics here tonight, just wanna talk about the facts and how we can protect the public's health. The best way out of this pandemic right now is by getting the shot. Vaccines are safe, they're abundant in California, and they're always gonna be free. And it's the single thing, the single most important thing that we can do to protect ourselves, to be able to protect our loved ones and our community. I wanna talk about the state assistance that has now come into Del Norte County, assisting the county, Crescent City as well, Sutter Coast, through this public health crisis. The state has sent two waves of additional medical staff into Del Norte County over the last two weeks to be able to help after the county and Sutter Coast has requested assistance. The first set of additional staffing is already assisting with expanded treatment, expanded testing, and expanded vaccine sites. We cannot say thank you enough to the hardworking men and women of Sutter Coast Hospital. They have stood up like never before, and we owe them a debt of gratitude. And we also need to provide them some relief, which is why the second request that is now has been implemented by the state is focused on additional staffing for the hospital, additional respiratory therapists, nurses, ICU nurses, and x-ray techs have now arrived in Del Norte County to be able to provide desperately needed relief for an overworked staff. And again, I want to say thank you to the nurses, the LVNs, the docs, the custodial staff at Sutter Coast for delivering in this time of need. Over 40 additional ventilators have also been ordered up. I know that is a scary number, but um, we're gonna focus on making sure pa patients are getting what they need. I wanna assure you that the state is very focused on helping Del Norte. We are in constant communication with all local government, the city, the county, along with the hospital. And here is our commitment. This is our promise to each and every one of you. We're gonna deliver. We're gonna deliver for any hospital, any health clinic, any public health department, any patient that is need. But because of the overwhelming numbers of patients that continue to come into the hospital, we are now having to finalize an air bridge plan for Del Norte County. And I wanna describe what that is gonna look like. We're gonna to need to line up air ambulances from around Northern California to quickly move COVID positive Del Norte County patients to other hospitals throughout the region that have room in their hospitals due to what we believe is a peak and surge in the coming few weeks. Now, this is the last thing that we want to do, but again, I wanna be candid. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Our number one priority right now is patient care. And if we can't deliver, deliver care here in the county due to the hospital being full, we will get patients care in other parts of Northern California. And I just wanna end it right here. 
this pandemic has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do with the public's health. The only fight that we have right now, the only fight that we have in Del Norte County is with the virus. And it shouldn't be with each other. The best way to get out of this pandemic is by getting a vaccine. And you're gonna hear from Dr. Stutz, along with Mitch Hanna, CEO of Sutter Coast, how to be able to get that shot in just a few moments. I'd like to cover the rollout and the run of show for tonight's town hall. Tonight, we're gonna to get you the latest information on the Delta variant, how it's affecting people in Del Norte County, in our schools, and we're gonna talk about how we're gonna be able to solve this crisis. We have very special guests with you tonight. Mitch Hanna, CEO of Sutter Coast, will be addressing the community in just a moment, giving us an overview of what they're seeing on the ground at the hospital. We're gonna then hear from the public health officer, Dr. Stutz. He's gonna give us a briefing on behalf of Del Norte County Public Health. We're gonna hear from our hardworking chair of the Board of Supervisors. His name is Chris Howard, and of course, the County Administrative Officer, Neil Lopez. We're then gonna to transition to hear from Crescent City. We're grateful that City Manager Eric Weir is with us tonight and our very capable Mayor Pro Tem, thank you so much, Mr. Inscore for being here tonight. And then we're gonna hear from School Superintendent Jeff Harris. He's gonna be talking about school reopening, our first day of school is coming up next week, testing capabilities and masking at the school. I wanna end it right here and say thank you. Thank you to the city, the hospital, to Sutter Coast, the school district. It is a unified front, making sure that patients are getting the care that they deserve here in Del Norte County. We are all working together seamlessly, and I promise you, this is just the beginning of the response. The most important part of this evening though is having a conversation with each and every one of you. If you're watching right now on Zoom and you'd like to be able to put a question in the chat, we welcome that. In addition, if you're watching on the Crescent City Facebook page, the Del Norte County Facebook page, we welcome you to be able to put questions and comments into the chat. We'll be taking your comments, questions, criticisms live here tonight. In addition, we have over 100 questions that have been submitted uh, prior to tonight's town hall, which we'll also be uh, reading off here in just a few moments. So without uh, further ado, uh, we're going to be turning our meeting over to the CEO of Sutter Coast Hospital. I want to take a moment to say thank you to Mitch Hanna and to his staff for the incredible care that they are providing this community. Mr. Hanna, the floor is yours for your hospital briefing. Good evening. Thank you, Senator McGuire. Good evening. Um, first, I just want to reassure the community that we are doing our level best to meet the needs of the community. And we're working closely, as Senator McGuire indicated, with uh, the uh, state government. California Department of Public Health, as well as uh, California Emergency Medical Services Authority to secure additional uh, equipment and staff so that we can meet the needs of our community here locally. Our goal is certainly not to transfer patients out. Occasionally, we will have to transfer patients out. Hopefully, we won't have to transfer too many out. Um, and those who we have had to transfer out thus far have been patients whose critical needs were more than a small community hospital of our nature could accommodate. Um, as Senator McGuire mentioned, our uh, census is quite a bit higher than normal. Uh, currently today, we've got a census of 36. Normally, we run between 20 and 25 this time of year. Um, we have uh, eight patients in our ICU right now in a nine-bed nine ICU. Uh, we have, I, I want to assure you, we've, we've um, prepared, again, with the uh, collaboration of the state. Uh, we've uh, modified some of our units, for instance, our acute rehab unit, our uh, post anesthesia care unit, so that we could accommodate inpatients in, in those areas other than acute rehab patients, for instance. So, uh, for instance, we normally have uh, nine ICU. We've got a capacity for 17 currently. Uh, we normally have 20, I'm sorry, 22 uh, medical care unit beds, and we have capacity now for 42. You've, if you've driven by the hospital, you've seen tents outside. One of those is a triage tent, so we can uh, triage patients coming in for uh, emergency care. And another is a tent for surge capacity. Uh, we have also been the beneficiary of additional staff um, uh, that uh, have, has been facilitated through the state. Um, you know, unfortunately, just like the rest of the community, 
our workforce has also been struck with COVID. Um, and so we've got vacancies that we didn't anticipate. We already had some vacancies previously. So it is a true blessing to have uh, more staff, uh, particularly in uh, critical care areas, respiratory therapy, ICU, and medical surgical. I did want to just give you um, a little bit of a, a breakdown on the types of um, patients we're seeing. And I, I know people have questioned why get the vaccine, because people who have the vaccine are getting uh, the uh, give it, getting COVID-19 as well. And I, I just want to share with you, while they are, there are people getting uh, COVID-19 who have been vaccinated. They're typically symptom, uh, symptoms are much uh, less significant. And in a couple minutes, I'm gonna share some graphics with you showing uh, admissions to the hospital. And uh, people who, basically what we've experienced throughout our system is uh, people who have not been vaccinated are eight times more likely to uh, contract the virus than those who have been vaccinated. And people who have not been vaccinated um, are 20 times more likely to be admitted to a hospital. Uh, so that's a pretty significant difference there. Um, of the uh, uh, patients that we are seeing in the hospital, 17% uh, on average have been vaccinated and 83% have been unvaccinated. Um, and the percent of patients under 65 is 52%. So the majority now that we're seeing are the under 65 credit. That's a deviation from the first pass with COVID-19 where the vast majority were uh, an, an older population. Um, I also wanna share with you, and I noticed that a uh, question uh, came up uh, in the chat box regarding monoclonal antibody treatment. That is available uh, by appointment Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m at the Sutter Coast Community Clinic. That is, for those of you who may not know, that's that kind of salmon colored building behind the hospital. Uh, also available is drive-through testing. So if you or a loved one or a neighbor is feeling like they might be sick and wanna get tested, uh, you can uh, do a drive-through. It doesn't need to be scheduled. Uh, that's Monday through Saturday, also 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Also Sutter uh, Community Clinic. And vaccinations are available uh, Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the community clinic. Um, we truly want to um, acknowledge the uh, assistance of uh, the Emergency Medical Services Authority and CDPH. It was just incredible. We had a call with them, I think it was two weeks ago, Friday, uh, about 5 o'clock, 5.30 at night. Uh, gave them what our needs were in the next day, yeah, probably about five o'clock or 5.30 at night, literally like a 24 hour turnaround time, a truck uh, rolled onto the hospital campus with most of the equipment that we needed. Um, Eric, if you wouldn't mind putting the slide, first slide up, I'd appreciate it. So this is just um, sharing with you the uh, population that we're seeing in the hospital. And this is a, a point in time, this is uh, today's uh, volume. And you can see we've got um, 23 COVID patients in the hospital. Um, and of those, if you look at the little torsos, those that are outlined in uh, black are patients above 65. So you can see the vast majority of the patients that we're seeing are um, uh, not in that above 65 group. If you take a look at critical care, also, you're going to see that the uh, majority of those in the critical care unit are under 65. The orange designates uh, those who have been un who are unvaccinated. So, of, of those older than 65, you will notice that um, uh, the, they are typically not um, just in the hospital. They they are getting um, sicker. And then uh, those on vents, you will uh, see that we've got um, a, a small percentage of uh, uh, age 65 and older that are, are ventilated. So um, typically what we saw first pass is more people in that old, older population getting vaccinated. And I probably should have put that data up for you to show how the county broke down free second pass. Uh, but I think that helps to um, contribute to the differences we're seeing. If you could uh, put up the second slide, Eric, I'd sure appreciate it. Um, just wanted to walk through a couple things with you. FDA and uh, CDC approved an additional vaccine dose for people who are uh, moderately to se severely immunocompromised um, and received the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. So if you feel like you 
qualify, you might uh, discuss that with your physician. On August 23rd, the FDA gave full approval to the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for ages 16 and up. Uh, that'll be marketed under the name Comirnaty. The Pfizer vaccine is still under emergency use authorization for ages 12 to 15 and for doses in certain uh, immunocompromised people. And coming up, we expect booster doses for the general population. Approval and guidance is expected in mid-September. Um, and the, the most recent that I've heard is it, it would be administered typically six to eight months after uh, patients had received their last uh, vaccine. And uh, the FDA is also using the uh, emergency use authorization of vaccination for pediatrics less than 12 years old. That's expected later in the uh, winter. If you could uh, move to the next slide. In about two some, minutes, sir. Yeah, these are some commonly asked uh, uh, questions. I just wanted to share these with you. Can I get a COVID-19 vaccine if I would like to have a baby one day? Yes, absolutely. Um, CDC recommends women trying to become pregnant, are pregnant, or breastfeeding be vaccinated. Uh, there's currently no evidence that the COVID-19 vaccination causes any problems with pregnancy or fertility for men or women. Uh, will the COVID-19 vaccine alter my DNA? No. Uh, do I still need to wear a mask and take other precautions after I'm vaccinated? Absolutely. I think, uh, I think we all know that. Uh, we just saw the data showing that people who have been vaccinated are still getting uh, the the uh, virus. Uh, can a COVID-19 vaccine make me sick uh, with COVID-19? No. People do have side effects, but they don't get sick with COVID-19. Uh, will getting a COVID-19 vaccine cause me to test positive for COVID-19 on a viral test? No. Um, none of the authorized and recommended COVID-19 vaccines cause you to test positive on viral tests. And then finally, if I've had a COVID-19, is it recommended to get this vaccine? Yes, it is. Uh, it is believed that the vaccine provides a much longer uh, immunity uh, than, than uh, having the uh, virus previously. And then uh, the last one is just in general, uh, please don't think that because you've gotten a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, you don't need a flu shot. They're, they're distinguishable. Uh, we're coming into flu season. We encourage everybody to uh, get a flu shot. Wash your hands frequently, particularly when you're out in public touching doorknobs, et cetera, wear a mask, and stay home when you're sick. Thank you. Thank you so much. That is Mitch Hanna, the CEO of Sutter Coast, Coast Hospital. We're going to be welcoming your questions and comments. They're coming in quickly now. If you'd like to be able to ask a question of any of our panelists, please do so by posting your question and comment in Facebook, uh, and we'll get to them here in just a few moments. Uh, we are now going to transition to a full COVID briefing from Del Norte County Public Health. We're first gonna hear from our public health officer. His name is Dr. Stutz. Uh, Dr. Stutz is gonna be giving us a full briefing on uh, what we're seeing here on the ground from the public health perspective. We'll then hear from the county administrative officer, uh, Mr. Lopez, about how uh, Del Norte County Office of Emergency Services is coordinating with the state. And then we're gonna turn the floor over uh, to our board chair, that's Mr. Chris Howard. Uh, Dr. Stutz, we welcome you. Uh, I also understand that there's been a new mask mandate that has been established in Del Norte County. I think you're gonna cover that as well here. That's late breaking here this afternoon. Dr. Stutz, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Senator. Um, so briefly, I just wanted to run over some of the numbers that we're seeing. We had um, almost, I think, 70 new cases just today. Um, the, the testing positivity rate in the county is quite high compared to the state average. Uh, as of this morning, it was something like 10.3%. So that's 10% uh, of, all, of all tests, COVID tests performed in the county are turning positive. Um, that's compared to a state average of uh, about 5.4% that's published on their website today. So we're almost double the state uh, average for uh, testing positivity. And that tells me that the prevalence in the community of COVID is quite high. Um, that, uh, you know, if you're having COVID symptoms uh, in Del Norte right now, you're very likely to have COVID. You're much more likely than in other counties um, and other counties where the, uh, where the testing positivity rate is lower. Um, so I wanted to sort of briefly run through how uh, uh, community members can find uh, access to testing 
and vaccines. Um, we're all uh, familiar with the uh, uh, Sutter Coast Hospital and, that, and that's available uh, there as well. But there's, uh, there are non-Sutter uh, options for vaccinations that are available in the community. Um, these can be found uh, on the uh, Delnard County Public Health website. And I'm gonna have or pull that up here for a minute. Um, if you just go to that link right there um, and then the, um, slash uh, vaccines, you can find uh, there's a complete list of uh, vaccination sites available uh, for county members for uh, county uh, uh, community members. Um, include this includes pharmacies such as CVS and Rite Aid, uh, Safeway, Walgreens, and Walmart. Um, those are all locations that you can reportedly uh, receive a vaccination. Um, and then uh, also uh, to contact your personal uh, physician's offices. Uh, many uh, physician's offices are providing their patients with vaccines, um, as well as uh, public health holding uh, specialty uh, vaccine clinics. Um, uh, so uh, I would ask the community to please check with the public health info hub um, on that same website uh, to find out uh, when we're holding specialty clinics in the community. Um, uh, as well as uh, there's, there are testing resources uh, available on that website. If you're wondering where to obtain a test outside of the Sutter system, um, uh, there, there's a list of testing resources there. Again, many uh, physicians' offices are providing that. Um, and there's also an OptumServe, a mobile testing uh, uh, resource that's available six days a week. Um, the scheduling and registration for that can be found uh, on that same website. Um, testing is also uh, apparently available at CVS. Um, and again, I'm going to um, uh, promote the healthcare providers in our community that are probably providing this for their patients. Um, so uh, I wanted to switch over now to talking about uh, the mask mandate that I issued uh, this afternoon. This was done in response uh, to uh, consultations with other health officers in California, um, as well as um, uh, comments from the community um, specifically requesting a mask mandate in our community to help uh, uh, curb transmission rates in, in Del Norte. Um, and uh, this is something that's um, thought uh, to help uh, in other counties that have been experiencing the surge lately and in the past. And so um, I went ahead and issued a mask mandate that can be found on the public health website as well. And I'm just briefly gonna read over the salient um, uh, important uh, points of that. Uh, mask mandate, and it's uh, item number four on the uh, on the entire mandate. You can find it on the website. So it reads as follows: uh, Individuals, businesses, venue operators, hosts, and others responsible for the operation of indoor public settings and outdoor crowded settings and events must require all pa patrons to wear face coverings for all indoor settings and outdoor crowded settings and events, regardless of their vaccination status and that um, these same uh, venues uh, must clearly uh, and visibly post um, signage uh, to that effect. Um, there's also a strong encouragement on there for these venues to provide uh, face coverings to uh, their patrons at no additional cost, but that is just a strong encouragement. Um, that's the salient um, uh, bit of the mask mandate. There are other parts of the mask mandate that um, uh, define you know, what, what a acceptable mask is and, and um, some exemptions from the masking mandate. But um, this is something that I really hope will um, impact our numbers uh, here in the county. And so I've gone ahead and issued that this afternoon. Uh, alongside the masking mandate, um, I've issued uh, some, some guidances to the community. Um, these are uh, guidances that are strongly recommended uh, for, and temporary for our current situation. Um, uh, I decided to do this because a number of members of the community have already curbed um, some of their activities. We've had restaurants that have voluntarily closed, and you know I applaud them for for taking uh, steps to uh, to do their part to, to curb transmission in the community. Um, and so I've gone ahead and issued a guidance alongside uh, the mask mandate. I'm just going to read the salient points of that as well. Um, I'm strongly recommending that. Uh, these same individual uh, individuals, businesses, venue operators, hosts, and others responsible for the operation of indoor public settings and outdoor crowded settings, strongly recommending that they consider voluntarily canceling their plans and operations during this COVID surge, um, so we can give some time for the healthcare facilities to catch up. Um, I'm also strongly recommending that bars and indoor dining facilities uh, limit their uh, patrons to 50% capacity. 
Uh, I'm strongly recommending that employers allow their employees to work from home and virtually when possible. Um, and there are other strong recommendations listed there that um, I'm sure that you're all aware of um, for vulnerable populations and for not vulnerable populations, getting vaccinated, um, getting your seasonal flu vaccination as well. Um, at all the standard, standard precautions that we've all, uh, that we've all heard multiple times. Um, so um, for many reasons, I, I'm hoping that, uh, that, these, that, the, that the community will take uh, these recommendations and this mask mandate and run with it and, um, and um, really take this crisis, uh, take some personal agency into this crisis. Um, uh, the leadership here can only do so much and without um, the community coming together and really owning this crisis as its own, and, uh, and everybody taking some personal responsibility here, it's gonna be very difficult to control uh, this surge. So I'm hoping that these actions will be enough. I see some of the comments um, uh, listed uh, in the chat box about, you know, are we gonna close down schools and this and that. You know, I'm hoping that these actions alone will, will be able to uh, uh, taper our numbers uh, to a more manageable uh, level so that we don't have to do anything uh, further. Uh, or close anything further down because that's not my intent or wish. Um, and so that's my update for now. And uh, with that, I believe I'm going to hand it over to Neil Lopez. Good evening, Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Dr. Stutz. Good evening, uh, Senator McGuire. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, you and your staff for planning and coordinating this uh, live update of uh, COVID-19 for the community. Um, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the role that Office of Emergency Services plays here at the county, um, primarily through uh, the position of the medical health operational area coordinator. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of that position, and I want to start by saying uh, that a brief overview will in no way do justice to the time and effort dedicated um, uh, to this position uh, or the significance of this position in coordinating this response. Um, so I'll go right into some of the roles and responsibilities. Um, uh, the, the medical health uh, operational area coordinator is responsible for uh, ongoing meetings and calls to coordinate with uh, multiple agencies um, and in response to this public health emergency. Uh, some of those agencies included uh, from the state are the Emergency Medical Services Authority, California Department of Public Health, California Office of Emergency Services, uh, California Department of Corrections and Re Rehabilitation, um, as well as locally, Sutter Coast Hospital, Don't Order Ambulance, Cal or Life Flight, County Public Health, County Admin, City Admin, um, and our partners to the South, Humboldt OES and Humboldt Public Health. Uh, this role is also responsible for submitting requests uh, for resources that are not available locally. Um, through this uh, uh, recent surge, uh, in response, they've submitted multiple requests for staffing for surgical hospital, medical equipment needed, uh, medical supplies needed. Um, they've assisted with uh, the on-site uh, surge support uh, in uh, personnel coordination, uh, the tent setup, um, uh, getting a generator uh, procured from uh, the city of Preston City. Thank you to the city for that. Um, uh, storage uh, for necessary supplies a forklift that was needed in order to put up this uh, expansion for the surge, uh, which was provided by uh, Ace Hardware locally. I wanna say thank you to them as well. Um, this was in coordination with um, Emergency Medical Services Authority from the state. Um, they are also, uh, th this role actually I'd like to say is, is uh, um, filled by Kimmy Scott, who is our OES manager. Um, I forgot to mention that at the start of this. Um, this position is also coordinating currently the uh, setup of step-down care, which will take place outside of the hospital, um, hopefully to relieve the hospital of some capacity and staffing uh, issues. Um, in addition to that, uh, the position has delivered uh, numerous uh, PPE uh, based on urgent needs in the community, and that's uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and they're responsible for the social media outreach as well as fielding calls from the public um, for information. And they're also currently uh, working with the regional medical health coordinator um, and in IMSA to uh, facilitate uh, necessary, if necessary, patient transports from Southern Coast Hospital. And as I said uh, at the beginning of this, this is uh, in no way does justice to the, to the role and the responsibilities of this position. 
Um, uh, I'd like to close by uh, just saying that I think that uh, it's uh, safe to say that all of us uh, in this community have recently been impacted by this virus. Uh, we have uh, friends and, and family and coworkers who have been extremely ill. Um, I myself have had friends that are on oxygen in ICU and in one instance have been flown out of the area for um, additional care. And so I know that it's, uh, I'd like to encourage our community to uh, join this uh, unified message and step up and uh, get vaccinated and also uh, put into place in your daily lives uh, uh, the guidances that are set, set in place by California Department of Public Health for wearing masks, avoiding large gatherings, uh, doing your best to uh, um, encourage others to do so. Uh, and with that, I would like to hand this over to the chair uh, of the board, Chris Howard. Thank you, Neil. This, is, this has been challenging for all of us and we do recognize that. But I think this unified approach that you're seeing here tonight from all sectors should be a strong message to all of us here in the community that through action, through diligence, through vigilance, we could come together like we always have and pull through this. But it's gonna take that common goal, that common vision, that blame is, is not appropriate at this time. It's only forward thinking that's gonna allow us to get through this. We're very fortunate that the county, that Sutter Coast and our resources at the state level have worked literally tirelessly over the last several weeks and over the last year and a half to ensure that this community's health is at the utmost highest priority. And we've gotten there and we've gotten there quite well, but this latest surge has obviously tested those resources. And I really appreciate the efforts of our county staff, most importantly, has stayed with this all through this last year and a half challenge. And I welcome Dr. Stutz, and more importantly, this mandate that he's passed tonight. The board unanimously supports this effort, and it's unusual when that comes to terms, but it has, and I'm sure the city council will be the same way. But most importantly, I want folks to realize we have lived through this in the last year and a half, and we've done quite well in curbing not only death here in this community, infection rates. We have demonstrated quite clearly that we could make it through it, but we relaxed. And it's not a time to relax any further. It's a time to move forward, follow those public health advisories, and allow ourselves the time to come to grips with the reality that we must protect our family members, we must protect our neighbors, and we must protect our friends here in this community. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. That's Chris Howard, Chair of the Del Norte County Board of Supervisors. We're grateful, sir, that you're with us. Mr. Lopez, Dr. Stutz, thank you so much. We're gonna hear more from Dr. Stutz, the public health officer for Del Norte County in just a few moments. Uh, we're now gonna to transition to Crescent City. As we mentioned, this is a unified approach, uh, all hands on deck effort, all levels of government working together to tackle this crisis. Uh, and that includes the Crescent City City Council, uh, along with the city manager and their uh, amazing team at the city. So first we're gonna hear from city manager, Eric Weir, and then we're gonna turn the floor over to the mayor pro tem for the city council. Uh, that of course is Blake in score. We'll turn it over to the city manager. City manager Weir, you have five minutes, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Senator McGuire. And thank you for so many of the community members to come out and, and be a part of this. This is certainly uh, a day that, that we, we wish would never can come when we first started facing the search. Our county is one of the worst counties in the entire Pacific Northwest. This surge is hitting us and it's hitting us hard and bringing our resources really to their limits in a lot of cases. Uh, with the city, we deal with police, fire, all those critical services, public works. They've all been tested during this time. I talked to our fire chief, Chief Gillespie, right before this meeting. He said that the vast majority of their calls that they're running on right now are COVID positive type calls, which not only affects their ability to respond to other calls, but it also you know, puts, puts everyone at risk. The more this virus surges in our community, the more everyone is at risk that they might also fall ill. So we're dealing with that on the, on the fire side. They are, they are rising to the challenge. They're meeting yeah, this, this, this time that we're in and, and they are there for the community, but it has had its impact. And it's not only on us as government agencies and, and public safety, it's also our businesses. We're seeing several businesses throughout the community, they're having to close. And it's not because of, of regulations or of shutdowns, they're closing because their employees are sick. 
or their employees are affected in a way that they have to quarantine. So they need to, they have to close their doors. We're seeing that as a community. We have to get away from that. One of the other businesses that, that hits home for me on a, on a personal level is, is Weir's Mortuary Chapel. Uh, Weir's My Family uh, started the business uh, a couple generations ago, recently sold to Joseph Sodorsky. We're to the point now that this pandemic is affecting that business, our mortuary business, dealing with the families that, of the deceased that we are seeing. They're beyond capacity at this point. We, as the emergency management, we're, we're providing resources or, or acquiring resources for an additional refrigeration truck to be provided to just deal with this search. That's, that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about case numbers anymore. We're not talking about the ifs and, and the hospital impacts. We're talking about our local mortuary who has built tremendous capacity and has always been here for this community and always will be here for this community. They are now at capacity. I talked to Joe Sidorsky this morning. He said that they will, they will always be here. They will manage this search, but they're managing it right now by working basically tirelessly throughout the morning and throughout the night. And when you're talking about that business or hospitals, these aren't numbers, right? These are, these are families. These are our neighbors. These are our friends. That's what we're talking about here. That's the type of urgency that we need as a community. That's where, like we have always done in the past as Del Norte County, we have to step up. We have to be able to handle this surge and we have the tools to do it. Uh, I won't take any more time, Senator. With that, I will turn it over to uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, and score. Thank you, Mr. Weir. Thank you, Senator, for hosting us tonight. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, when this surge started and I started encouraging people to, to take it seriously, I had somebody refer to the, uh, the, to the fable, the little boy that cried wolf. You, you told us to do all these things last year and it never materialized. Why should we believe you now? Well, I'll tell you why you should believe us now because the wolf is here. Uh, the, the proof is here, as Mr. Weir just said, the, the mortuary is full of our friends and neighbors, people who've lost their life. Uh, some of those are, are people who have passed away for other causes other than COVID, but clearly COVID is running rampant through our community, and we need to take this seriously. There is nowhere in the Western United States that's seeing a surge at the levels of what we're seeing right here. Those are facts. Uh, we need to do our part. Uh, for a year, I said, well, you need to consider getting the vaccine. Uh, I'm going to tell you, you need to get vaccinated. Well, you need to do it for your friends, your family, your neighbors. Um, talk to your healthcare professional. I've not heard one uh, family doctor advise against the vaccine. If yours does, then, then that's between you and your doctor. But we have a responsibility to one another in this community. I've seen lots of people in the in the, the chat ask, who's gonna who's going to enforce the mask mandate? You are. You're gonna enforce it. You make the conscious decision yourself to do the responsible thing for you, for your neighbors, and for the people in this community. We shouldn't have to have somebody managing a mask mandate. We shouldn't put that on a on a on a server at a restaurant who, who's going to get hassled. Take responsibility, Delaware County and Crescent City. We've got to do this together. We're not all in the same situation, but we're all in the same fight. And you and I have a responsibility to step up right now. And you have the ability to do it. Yes, maybe it seems like I was a little boy that cried wolf last year with videos and this and that, but the wolf is here. And we need to protect one another. It's been said by everybody here tonight. We need to do this as a community. I implore you. If you have any confidence in my willingness to always try to speak the truth the best that I can, then hear me clearly now. We need to take this serious, Delaware County and Crescent City. We need to help one another. And I'm just asking you personally, please do what you can do to help curb this tide. Thank you so much.
So Mayor Pro Tem, thank you. Thank you to the mayor as well. And of course, the rest of the city council, I'm really grateful Mayor Pro Tem that you are here this evening. Uh, we are now gonna transition to one final update on this evening's briefing. Uh, and that is gonna be from the school superintendent. That's Jeff Harris. Uh, Mr. Harris is gonna be talking about what parents and students can expect on the first day of school next week. Uh, he, uh, the superintendent and the school board have implemented uh, a testing program uh, at the school district. We're gonna talk about that what that means and how it's going to work. Uh, and then he's also going to be talking about school sports and community attendance and just being candid, uh, needing to be incredibly cautious, uh, even for outdoor activity right now due to the variant and the significant spread that we're seeing. Superintendent Harris, I'm going to turn it over to you for a full update. Five minutes, sir, on uh, start of school and testing. Great. Thank you, Senator. So, um, Everyone knows schools are opening this Monday, August 30th, in person for all students from preschool through 12th grade. One question that I've received several times and I've seen tonight in the chat is how can you open schools in the current situation? Uh, you know, the short answer is state law requires that we open schools for in-person instruction. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear. The longer answer, though, is that our students suffered disproportionately by not having access to a variety of services and, quite honestly, a comprehensive education and it damaged families. It damaged um, many aspects of our community and our society. Um, one key fact for our community is that last year we had very few instances of person-to-person -person transmission in our schools. Um, that was primarily prevented due to the focus that we had on preventative strategies and to our staff and our community as a whole taking precautions to keep one another safe, including getting vaccinated, um, you may remember last year when most of the state was shut down all year, we started school in September and successfully ran throughout the year. Um, because of what we've learned, we will continue to implement the same universal precautions of washing our hands, sanitizing, wearing a mask, maximizing physical distancing, and staying home when students are sick. Um, the same that we used last year, you may have seen um, our campaign of hands, face, space, and home. We're going to continue that. Um, just so the community also knows, we make the number of positive cases for both students and staff available at dnusd.org slash family resources. You can check that daily. Um, insofar as vaccines are concerned, students are not required to be vaccinated. However, recently, the California Department of Public Health mandates that school staff are required to either verify their status as fully vaccinated or to participate in weekly testing. Uh, likewise, any student who's considered a close contact to a positive case may qualify for a modified quarantine, which means they can remain in school if they're tested twice per week with parent consent. Um, through additional funding provided by the state of California, we're also hiring two additional nurses and a safety coordinator and training hopefully more than 30 additional staff members on how to organize and administer the Binax antigen test for staff and students and to support the health of our student staff and by extension, our community. Uh, this leads to some of the most anticipated events that we have in our county, and that's high school athletics. Uh, tomorrow night is the first football game, uh, and we'll quickly move on to in other sports. We've been working with Dr. Stutz, school administration, and the California Interscholastic Federation Humboldt Del Norte League to provide a safer venue for our students to participate in the sports. Um, our youth will remain masked at all times, except when playing. Um, they've committed to following the rules to stay healthy. And you heard Dr. Stutz, and we're going to um, enforce that as well. We're gonna be asking the same as spectators. All spectators will need to wear masks at all times when in the stadium, and will be asked to physically separate to the fullest extent that they're able or stay home if they're feeling ill. You know, last year, some of you may remember, we installed professional grade live streaming cameras and audio equipment in all of our major sports venues to allow community members to watch games from home and to support the health of our staff and students by limiting contact. We strongly encourage our community to use this service, at least for the time being. Last year, one of the folks said the best seat in the house was in my house. So um, use that service, limit, limit coming to the game if you can. Um, I always get asked, where do these come from? Why are you guys making this up? We don't make these up. These are the California Department of Public Health orders. And all of these orders will be posted on our website, dnusd.org. Um, like has been said tonight, it's up to all of us to step up and protect the most vulnerable members of our community by doing what we can. And I truly do believe that 
our 4,700 youth of our community deserve the very best that we can all bring to them. Thank you so much, Mr. Superintendent. And just being candid, everyone, there's a reason why the California Department of Public Health had rules so that we avoid what we're seeing here now. So just being candid, folks may not have liked it, but it kept us out of the situation that we're here now. And so now what we need to do is come together uh, and figure out how we can work together as a community to be able to get out of this crisis. That means we're gonna have to mask up. That means we're gonna have to be able to work on increasing the vaccination rate in Del Norte County. That means we're gonna have to work on getting the vaccination rate up at Pelican Bay Prison, which has some of the lowest rates of vaccination rate, uh, lowest rates of vaccinations among any state prison in the entire system. It's our largest employer here in California. It means that we're gonna to have to have some difficult conversations to be able to save lives. And that means that we're all gonna to have to have some sacrifice here in the coming weeks. I just wanna be candid about that. It's gonna take sacrifice to be able to get out of the challenges that we're faced with in the coming weeks, to keep our healthcare system thriving, to keep our families healthy, and to keep our loved ones safe. So let's get right now uh, into the questions that have come in. So I'd like to uh, talk about teachers who are not vaccinated. Question has come in here tonight uh, to Superintendent Harris. What is the process for testing for teachers who are not vaccinated at this point? And if you wanna talk about the state mandate for uh, teachers and classified staff being vaccinated, Superintendent Harris. Absolutely, so, um, it, it, so number one, it applies to all school staff, um, that's, all of our classified, all of our certificated, regardless of what their role is within the school district, they are required to either um, show proof of full vaccination or they are subject to uh, testing one time per week. Uh, as I said earlier, that's gonna be the Binax antigen test. It's a rapid test. Um, we will have uh, medically trained staff who will be organizing and putting that together and we'll have supports throughout the, um, through the school district. Uh, again, and those supports have been paid for by the state of California as an add-on to school funding. It doesn't come directly out of our school funding. Um, we, we have to have the full system up and implemented uh, no later than October 15th. Our goal is to have it uh, within the next week. Thank you so much. That's Superintendent Harris. We're taking your questions right now. If you're watching us on Facebook, feel free to drop your question, your comment, your concern, even your criticism into the comment. We're going to try to get to as many, uh, as many questions here in the next 15 or 20 minutes. And we want to remind folks, every Thursday evening, every Thursday evening for the next few weeks, we'll be here on Facebook on Zoom at 6 p.m. Uh, taking your questions and your comments uh, with those who are on the front lines of battling this crisis. I'd like to go now to CEO Mitch Hanna. Uh, Mitch Hanna is the CEO of Sutter Coast Hospital. I'd like to talk about testing results and turnaround time. And then I'd like to go to Dr. Stutz, the public health officer for Del Norte County, uh, to talk about the same. Um, Mr. Hanna, uh, there is a new expanded testing capacity, state working with Sutter Coast on expanding the number of tests. Talk to us about turnaround time. If I get tested on a Thursday, how quickly will I see the re results coming back if I do the drive-through at Sutter Coast? I believe those are taking two to three days. If you're in an emergency capacity and you're tested in the ER, those are very quick turnarounds. Got it, thank you so much. Dr. Stutz, same in the community. Are we looking at a 48 to 72 hour turnaround time? Yeah, it certainly depends on where you have the test done and what kind of test it was. Um, if you're getting it done at a, uh, a primary care clinic's office, it depends on uh, what kind of tests they're doing and where they're sending it. I would not be surprised if there are delays in those tests um, coming from prim primary care offices uh, to laboratories. Um, most primary care clinics do not have access to uh, on the bench PCR uh, you know, testing machine. Uh, many of them uh, simply have Binex now, which can be done very rapidly. Um, but you know aren't necessarily as accurate so it really depends on where you had the test done and what kind of test it was but uh, if you're having your test sent for a pcr outside the facility where you had the test done i would not be surprised if there are um, uh, waiting times and delays in getting those results and so be prepared to to you know to isolate yourself at home to quarantine yourself at home uh, before you get those results so let's talk about that, Dr. Stutz. So look, there's a comment, a comment uh, in the chat today saying that masks don't work, uh, saying that masks are not um, uh, clean, that they are not hygienic. 
I'm going to be candid. That's BS. Um, so let's talk about the facts. One of the reasons why that you've implemented a mask mandate is because uh, it's going to help stop the spread of COVID, number one. But then also, uh, what happens if you have symptoms between the time you test and then your results? What should folks do? Talk about the masks. Why are masks important? Uh, can you dispel the myths about masks? And then talk about if you have symptoms from the time you get the test until you uh, actually get the results, what should you do? Uh, uh, one minute, please, Mr. Dodd. Absolutely, Dr. yeah, yeah, easily. I mean, I, I use masks in the hospital every day and um, you know, surgeons use masks for hours to days on end, you know, during lengthy surgeries. Um, you know, these are things that we know are effective uh, simply because we've used them for so long and the data does support their use, uh, does uh, demonstrate uh, very clearly that they have uh, an effect in reducing transmission of viruses and bacteria. That's why they're required in surgeries. Uh, that's why we use them all the time in healthcare. This is everyday stuff for us and this is not a surprise. Um, uh, you would never see a surgeon walk into a surgical suite without a mask. Um, that person uh, wouldn't have a job anymore. So uh, there's a really, really good reason why we use those things. And I can tell you, um, because we use machines that measure our CO2 and oxygen levels um, at the bedside in the emergency department, every day I'm in there for a shift. And I can tell you, uh, masks do not affect your CO2 or oxygen levels. I've done the test at the bedside. I can tell that it doesn't affect those uh, your respiratory um, uh, uh, electrolytes. It, it just doesn't. Um, and multiple studies have demonstrated that as well. So, um, you know, they're not harmful. Um, if you're going to strap 100 masks on your face, okay, maybe then they might affect your oxygen levels. But no, it's, it's just not realistic. Uh, Dr. Sutz, 30 seconds, please. We got a lot of questions coming in. Talk to us. You go get a COVID test you have symptoms, in that 48 to 72 hours, what should you do? Yeah, stay at home. Uh, there is no reason to uh, you know, run out and seek uh, another test or, or implore somebody to do it faster. Um, you know what you need to do. You need to stay at home away from people. The, the result, the actual result isn't as important as the action that you're taking to keep yourself away from other people. With the, uh, the Delta variant, Dr. Stutz, if someone is exposed uh, to a COVID positive uh, patient, how long would you recommend that they stay at home? Three days, five days? Obviously they should go get tested, but what would be your recommendation? The best window of testing is between three and five days for the Delta variant. Um, and that's you're, you're most likely to turn positive somewhere during that time. Don't go run out and te get tested you know, an hour after your, after your exposure. Wait a few days, let it brew in your system if it's going to. If the test is going to be more accurate. That's Dr. Stutz, public health officer for Del Norte County. We're now going to be turning uh, our focus over to schools once again. Superintendent Harris, a uh, lot of questions coming in in regards to the opening of schools. Uh, Marissa Lee writes in, will students in schools be physically distanced uh, at least three feet when they must be on masks in order to eat breakfast and lunch? So how are each of the school sites going to focus physical distancing during snack or lunch period? So along with what's going on in the classroom and snack and lunch, it's going to be a maximizing of distancing. So, you know, the masks do not have to be worn when people are eating or drinking or if they have a medical um, uh, exemption. Um, so as they are eating, as they are in those rooms, we're going to have staff members that are going through those, those areas. They're going to be reminding kids if they are sitting too close to spread apart. If they are done eating and they're sitting there talking, the masks need to go back on uh, and they could be ushered out of those areas if they, when they're done. So um, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge. I'm not gonna pull any, you know, we're, we're gonna have to make sure, we're gonna have to monitor. We've got great staff that are dedicated to doing this and they're gonna have to monitor what's going on in those rooms. Superintendent Harris, questions are coming in tonight about what happens if uh, a teacher a classified employee or a student in a classroom uh, is COVID positive. How does that work? How are parents informed and what is the procedure if a situation like that arises? Superintendent Harris. So just like we did last year, um, if there's a positive case in a classroom, we'll notify the members of the class. Um, but then we have several different protocols depending on whether um, the teacher was vaccinated or not vaccinated, whether everyone in the class was masked or there were students who were unmasked at the time, which should not happen because we are gonna make sure that every kid's masked. 
Um, and then that's when we get back into what I spoke very briefly about in, in my section was, if we do have someone who is positive, the positive person will have to um, be quarantined. We'll work closely with public health on that to make sure that that's done appropriately, um, quickly, and, and for the length that's prescribed. The second thing that we'll be doing is we'll be determining which students qualify for um, modified quarantine. That modified quarantine does allow a student to stay in a class. However, with parental consent, they would have to be tested two times per week. Um, if there's somebody outside of a class who's positive, if there's someone who works in, let's say, our maintenance department or our um, transportation department, um, then what we would do at that point is they would just go on quarantine, again, under um, the um, auspices of the public Department of Public Health. Thank you so much. That's Superintendent Harris, Del Norte County Schools. We're going to go to Dr. Stutz, and then we're going to go to uh, Supervisor Howard, Chair of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, this is in regards to the mask mandate. Uh, Mike writes in tonight, Dr. Stutz, when does the mask mandate go into effect? Uh, the mask mandate goes into effect, I think, officially at 12.01 uh, a.m. tomorrow morning, so tonight, right? That's great. So tonight, so tomorrow morning, as folks are going to work or uh, going out in the community, uh, all indoors. One more time, 30 seconds, Dr. Stutz. Tomorrow morning, when folks leave the house, what should they do and expect in regards to wearing masks indoors? Uh, they should always wear their masks indoors um, at work, uh, going out to supermarkets, restaurants, wherever they're going, out in the public, away from their home. They should always wear their masks. That's uh, Dr. Stutz, Public Health Officer, Del Norte County. We're now going to go to the chair of the board. Supervisor, Supervisor Chris Howard. Uh, Henry writes in, uh, so all the supervisors approve the mask mandate at Supervisor Howard. Again, Dr. Stutz, as our public health officer, Delaware County has unilateral authority under state statute to implement the mask mandate and whatever else he feels necessary in order to help curve what we're seeing here today. The board, just to be 100% clear, supports this. We don't have the authority to tell him what to do, but we can certainly support these efforts, and we have done that today. Thank you so much. That's Chair Howard from the Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much, Supervisor. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Mitch Hanna, CEO of Sutter Coast Hospital. Mr. Hanna, uh, Lisa writes in, can we get flu shots administered like we did last year? It was nice to have my whole uh, family get a flu shot through a drive through So, uh, Mr. Hanna, you mentioned uh, flu, sh flu seasons right around the corner, plus layered with COVID. Talk to us about Sutter Coast's thought on getting those flu shots out. 60 seconds, sir. Uh, we're not, we, we haven't actually planned for drive through on the flu shots, uh, but we certainly can schedule the whole family to come in at the same time. So it's just a matter of calling in and scheduling or going uh, in through the walk-in clinic. Thank you so much, Ms. Chanda. We're now going to go to the city manager for Crescent City, Mr. Weir. Uh, Eric writes in, uh, how is the mask mandate going to be enforced? Uh, I'm going to have you give the city perspective, and then we'll go to uh, CAO, County Administrative Officer Lopez from the County of Del Norte. There are several questions, just being honest about it, about how, gonna, how folks are going to enforce the mask mandate. Uh, city Manager Weir, and then to County Administrative Officer Lopez. And really, as uh, I believe the mayor pro tem uh, spoke about, you know, this is going to come down to a community taking ownership of this. So we have the mandate. People need to wear masks. We're expecting business owners to also uh, help enforce that that mask mandate. And the uh, the business owner then has that uh, authority then to ask someone to leave their business. Uh, and if they won't leave their business or they won't put on the mask, then at that point in time, they can call the proper authorities to have that person removed. Thank you so much. That's the county administrative officer. Uh, excuse me, that's the city manager, Eric Weir. Thank you. I was just getting a, a question off the chat. I apologize about that, city manager. Let's go to uh, the county administrative officer, Neil Lopez. Um, actually, city manager Weir said that perfectly. I don't really have anything to add to that. It's Thank going to be so something much. that we hope that the community complies with. Uh, business officers can, or businesses can enforce it uh, exactly how uh, city manager Weir stated. And look, and just being honest about it, and Dr. Stutz, uh, feel free to chime in on this. And I know you've talked about masks. This is the simplest form of stopping the spread of COVID that we can all do in the community is it to is wear a mask. Yeah. It is the simplest. I, and, please. you know, I would chime in here and say that, you know, with regards to the enforcement issue, 
Um, you know, having spoken to a number of other county uh, health officials um, about their mask mandates and how they enforce them, uh, you know, the community actually, the communities actually did a good job of self-enforcement. And in most cases, it wasn't entirely necessary to send anyone out there with a baton and, and a ticket book to, to write some fines for people. You know, when people were, people in these communities were asked to wear masks to, for the public good, and for the, in large part, they did do it. So I'm hoping that our community will do it here too. That's Dr. Steps, Public Health Officer for County Downlord. We're gonna go now to Mitch Hanna. He is the CEO of Sutter Coast Hospital. Uh, Mike writes in from KFUG Community, uh, Community News. Um, if you can repeat, how many hospitalizations and deaths has there been, including Sutter Coast Hospital and other facilities that have received patients from Del Norte County? Uh, Mr. Hanna, I know that this is a, a difficult question for so many, but if you want to repeat those uh, really sobering statistics. Actually, I didn't, I didn't provide those. I don't have those statistics because, you know, one, we, we don't really have a way of knowing exactly what's happening outside of our facility. Dr. Stutz might have that. I don't know. But uh, with respect to uh, in our community, I think in the last week we've had six or seven deaths uh, in our hospital uh, due to COVID. Um, so and then four, four today, so I think that brought it up to 10, right? Somewhere right in there, Mr. Yes. Hanna? Yes, yes. No, thank you so much. Uh, that's Mitch Hanna. Um, Dr. Setz, so we've seen over the last seven to 10 days, and I don't want to speak for uh, CEO Hanna, but over the last seven to 10 days, we've seen approximately 10 deaths uh, in coming from the hospital, four in the last 24 hours. Uh, Mr. Stutz, I know that you're looking at the remainder of the community you believe there are most likely more, uh, but it's still pending further investigation at the coroner's office. But I, I don't want to become too morbid in this question, but uh, it's uh, a member of the media that's asking, Dr. Stutz. So what was the question is that we, we do we believe that there are other people in the community that Correct. have died from COVID yeah, and haven't presented to the hospital? Absolutely, especially at this, this level uh, uh, of cases that we're seeing right now, there are absolutely people in the community, I can guarantee it that uh, didn't make it to the hospital on time. And people already don't make it to the hospital on time, but when you have this many people with a serious life-threatening condition and the hospital being as backed up as it is um, and people not wanting to come in and be seen, um, this is something that we know has happened in the past. Um, absolutely, there are people out there that didn't make it to the hospital. And I, I'm sure that will come through with the, in the coroner's reports when I finally receive them. It's devastating. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a really emotional moment, if I could be candid. Uh, for all of us and uh, our heart goes out to those who um, who has lost a family member who has a family member in the hospital uh, and I am so sorry and I know all of us are so sorry and uh, I promise you that we are all working together to be able uh, to gain control of this crisis. I'd like to go to our next question and this is coming in from uh, Nazi uh, at uh, KAEF TV. Um, this is gonna to go to Mitch Hanna, the CEO of Sutter Coast. Nazi writes in, Humboldt on Wednesday reported a COVID related death of a 20 year old patient. How old is the youngest patient who has passed of COVID in Del Norte? Uh, this is coming in from uh, North Coast News, uh, Mr. Hanna. I do not have that data. Uh, next question coming in from Nazi is, how much longer do you expect the hospital will be operating under its current surge plan. We talked about potentially two to four weeks, but Mr. Hanna, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I'm an optimist by nature, so I would like to say two to four weeks. Um, you, know, you know what, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think if we all do what, what we've been talk, talking about today, do the right thing, I think we can control this. I really encourage people get vaccinated, mask, socially distance, wash your hands. It's really up to all of us in terms of how long this goes on. And Mr. Hanna, something that we have talked about um, outside of this meeting is not all of us have supported the same person for president. Uh, we come from different political parties and, uh, and, and beliefs. But I think one area where we're unified, uh, Mr. Hanna, is um, we got to get folks yep. vaccinated. But so I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Mr. Hanna, but I think you said it best in an earlier conversation. It's not a political issue. This is a, a health issue. This is a community issue. Uh, we need to do this for our families, for our neighbors, for our community. Yeah, and uh, again, I'm gonna stress this. Uh, 
The only fight that we have is with this virus, not with each other, uh, which is why it's so critical to get vaccinated. I'm going to go to Dr. Stutz. Dr. Stutz is the public health officer for the county of Del Norte. Next question coming in uh, from North Coast News. How much outreach uh, is the county doing to ensure local residents in rural areas of the county have access to vaccine? So I'm going to, uh, Dr. Stutz, I'm going to have you reiterate all the locations, including Open Door as well, but all the locations where you can get vaccinated. And then I'm going to go to CEO Mitch Hanna to repeat the hours of the vaccination a drive through vaccination uh, clinic at Sutter Coast. But let's go to Dr. Stutz first. Yeah, so again, um, all of the um, vaccination locations can be found on uh, the uh, public health website. Um, there are a number of outreach activities. Um, you know, we realize that not everybody has, uh, you know, access to nobody, not everybody has Facebook, not everybody's on the internet, and we live in a remote county. Um, some people don't have access to uh, internet, period. Um, so, you know, it's unfortunate that we recently lost um, uh, access to the SNAP nurse function uh, uh, from the state because, well, honestly, we couldn't we couldn't afford them, and the state funding for that disappeared. Um, so that was a that was a, um, a resource that we had. Uh, it was a mobile vaccination service that we had operating in the county, and although it was only doing a handful of of people um, uh, with every event, it was um, grabbing more of those people that that don't have access um, to um, some of the more uh, mainstream vaccination sites. And so um, that is a priority. Um, all of these rural counties in Northern California, um, equity is a huge priority. And right now um, there is a big push um, for uh, funding and outreach to communities that don't, uh, that don't have access to some of the normal amenities that, um, that uh, more urban areas have. That's Dr. Stutz. Before we leave you, Dr. Stutz, and go to Mitch Hanna, because the state has invested in expanded vaccination uh, capacity at Sutter Coast, I, I'd like to uh, get your, your comment from Jamie. Jamie writes in regards to masks. What about choice? Choice, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, ultimately, you do have the choice. I mean, what? I'm not going to go around with a nightstick and, and, uh, and give everyone a ticket for not wearing a mask, but somebody could. Um, you know, and uh, and so uh, you know, again, this is going to be up to the the what what you feel is 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 right. Um, and I'm telling people that uh, this mandate is going to be effective. Um, it's been effective in other counties, and it should be effective here. There's no reason that it should shouldn't be effective here. Um, yeah, personal choice is great, but when your personal choice uh, you know impacts the lives of others, that's where we get to regulate things, and and um, that, that's just the way it is, especially with a health emergency. I'm going to leave that right there. Uh, I'm well said. Uh, Ruby writes in, um, are vaccinated people carriers? Dr. Stutz, uh, I don't, I'm not a medical professional, but what I will say is, yes, vaccinated folks could be carriers, but the rate of hospitalization or serious illness is dramatically decreased. In fact, there are very few vaccines that are anywhere between 80 and 90% effective. When we were first talking about the vaccines, we were hoping that it's gonna be 60 to 70% effective. Uh, but talk to us um, about how uh, vaccinated folks are carriers. And it's not, uh, it's, it's not the fault of the vaccine. There's no vaccine that is perfect, but it's gonna be the symptoms in which you see. But Dr. Stutz, uh, comment on that, please. Yeah, so I mean that's an excellent question. There's been a lot of buzz about this, you know, these studies that have demonstrated that uh, vaccinated people can carry and transmit the virus. That's very true, um, but nobody knows how often that happens, or you know, does it happen to the same frequency as people who are unvaccinated? Um, and so, you know, just because it happens doesn't mean it happens often. It doesn't mean there's no reason to get vaccinated. And the, the main purpose, the main point of vaccination is not necessarily to prevent transmission, although I'll bet the data will show that it does eventually. Uh, it's to keep people out of the hospital and to keep people from dying. The mask is to prevent transmission, right? Is our primary intervention to pre prevent transmission as well as social distancing, basic hygiene, washing our hands, avoiding large events, that sort of a thing. So we have, we have lots of tools at our disposal to prevent transmission and to prevent ourselves from getting sick. So let's use them all. We have about five more minutes uh, and we're so grateful. We've extended the time due to the number of uh, questions that are coming in. I got to tell you, there are dozens of questions that have come in this evening. Uh, Dr. Stutz, we're going to stick with you. Lynette, Lynette is very open and honest. And Lynette, thank you so much for writing in. She says, 
I am not anti-vax, but I am terrified to get vaccinated. So it, talk to Lynette on why uh, it's important to get vaccinated, but also talk with her about those fears, because I think there are a lot of folks that are scared to get vaccinated, Dr. Stutz. Dr. Stutz is the public health officer for Del Norte County. What would you say to the Lynette tonight? Yeah, and I think that's the every I think that's everybody's main concern um, when it comes to a vaccination with the, with a new vaccine. Everybody looks at it like a new drug, um, and I would want to ask Lynette what you know what what exactly are her fears? But uh, you know those are very valid concerns. This is a new uh, this is a new vaccine that we're proposing that that you that we we give to the population on a large scale. Um, do we know all the side effects of the vaccine in the long term? Absolutely not. We don't know. We don't. There's no way we can know that. We can speculate, you know, mechanistically as physicians that we don't really know that. But I would reiterate that again, we don't know what the long-term effects of COVID are. We're seeing a lot of, you know, terrible long-term effects from COVID itself. And and so, you know, if you ask, if you really ask physicians and ask physicians, you know, what they think about the risks of, of the long uh, long-term risks of the vaccine versus the long-term risks of COVID. And most physicians are going to tell you to choose the long-term risks of the vaccine over the long-term risks of COVID. Uh, I mean, this is uh, you're it's all in medicine. You're always exchanging one risk for another. Um, you're, you're, we're, we're taking uh, the lower risk of having a side effect from a vaccine over the much larger risk right now of having a very bad outcome from actual COVID. And I encourage people just to find a way to get over that fear. Um, you're doing something great for your community when you're getting vaccinated. This is a brave act that you can do for your community. Um, you know, have some courage. Um, do something for your community. It's something every individual can do. Uh, you know, without even telling anybody. I mean, you're you're doing it. So oh, I, there you go, Doctor Sets. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, if you just want to finish your last few sentences uh, again, you're on mute. Yeah, just uh, just to reiterate that this is a this is a very you know find a way to get over your fears um, if you can um, you know talk to doctors talk to everyone you know um, who who's had the vaccine you know just decide, truly decide for yourself but also you know find a way to get over your fears and get your questions answered. Uh, we're gonna uh, take thirty seconds on this next question to Heather. Then we're gonna go to Mitch Hanna, CEO of Sutter Coast, Doctor Stutz. Uh, Heather asked, could the doctor get give us clarification on recommended quarantine days. So if an individual is exposed, talk to us. Obviously, you should go get a test, but then what are your quarantine day recommendations, Dr. Stutz? Absolutely. Just like uh, just like everywhere else, pretty much, if you never get symptoms, but you are significantly exposed, or if you develop symptoms, or sorry, if you, if you get a positive test, but you never have symptoms, um, 14 days is the number. You're going to be, you know, you're going to be isolated for two weeks, um, and, uh, and that's it. If you, if you have symptoms and you tested positive, or if you suspect you have COVID and you tested negative, even, um, it's 10 days from the start of symptoms. Um, as long as your symptoms are improving at day 10 and you haven't had a fever, you know, without the help of fever reducing medication, 10 days is the number. So, you know, as a rule of thumb, if 10 days, if you're symptomatic, um, 14 days, if you're not, or if you're just a suspected case. That is Dr. Stutz. He's the public health officer for the county of Del Norte. We're now going to go to Mitch Hanna. Uh, Mitch Hanna is the CEO of Sutter Coast Hospital. We are going to be going into our lightning round of questions. We're going to ask each of our panelists to give us a 30-second response to try to get as many questions as possible. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Hanna. Mr. Hanna, one of the items that we did not go over one more time, give us the hours of operation for your vaccine clinic, as well as uh, the clinic for uh, testing, both of which state has invested additional dollars with Sutter Coast to help expand access, please. So the vaccinations are offered Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. at Sutter Coast Community Clinic. And the drive-through testing is also Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Same location, but it's a drive-through. And I do just want to reiterate one thing. If, if you are concerned about the cost, please don't be. Uh, there is no cost to you. If you have insurance, your insurance company will be billed. If you do not have insurance, you are not going to be billed for the vaccine. It is free. Uh, and uh, please don't let that be a barrier. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. I'm going to go to Superintendent Harris. Superintendent Harris, if possible, we're looking for a 30 second response. Kim writes in, has the school increased filtration of the HVAC, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems uh, throughout the sites? 
We most absolutely have. Um, we've actually installed HVAC units in many classrooms that haven't had them. We've upgraded all of our filtration to MERV 13, which is the standard, uh, the higher standard for uh, COVID filtration. And then for our classrooms who don't have HVAC, we are getting uh, filtration units that will sit in the classrooms. Uh, I'm going to go to, uh, if it works, I'm going to go to the uh, county administrative officer, Mr. Lopez, as well as the city manager, uh, Eric Weir. Mr. County administrative officer, uh, we're getting questions about if businesses aren't enforcing the mask mandate, uh, will the county or the city, whether it's environmental health, the sheriff's office, the police uh, department, visit uh, those businesses? Let's go to the county administrative officer, Neil Lopez and the unincorporated uh, uh, communities. Uh, and then we'll go to Eric Weir to, to give their uh, discussion about Crescent City. Mr. Lopez. Um, I honestly don't think enforcement uh, to be any different than it was the first time around when COVID started uh, in March of this past year. Uh, you know, businesses can be reported that are out of compliance or customers can be reported that are out of compliance. And we'll make every effort, of course, from a business owner standpoint, uh, as well as the county and the city uh, to, to try to do this without uh, enforcement. I mean, we're hoping that the community will comply with its health orders um, as we did in the past. And uh, going forward, I think it's just a responsibility of the community to do this. And hopefully enforcement is not an issue and something that we have to address. Thank you so much. That's the county administrative officer for the county of Del Norte. Uh, that is Neil Lopez. We're now going to go to the city manager for Crescent City, Eric Weir, on enforcement. Yes, and I, I agree with, that, with Mr. Lopez. Masking and, and being the mask police is really hard for our law enforcement. They're dealing with so many calls that come in on a regular basis, these community emergencies. So that's where we really need the community to, to do their part, to step up, to, to, to wear the mask, right? And, and have this be a, a personal responsibility. Uh, if they do so, then we will not only you know, be in compliance with the order, but we will start to overcome this pandemic that we're in. So really that's the ask. Uh, like uh, Mr. Lopez said, if there are complaints, we run it through uh, with public health. We can send letters to businesses just to make sure that they are aware of the uh, of the order and can put that proper sign so we inform everybody. Eric Weir, city manager for the city of Crescent City. Thank you so much, Mr. City Manager. Final three questions, and we so appreciate everyone hanging with us. Uh, a reminder, next Thursday at 6 p.m., uh, there will be a shorter uh, but just as important community briefing with the city, the county, the hospital, and the school district. Uh, we are now going to be going to Dr. Stutz again. Dr. Stutz is the public health officer. He is also a doctor uh, at Sutter Coast as well. He's helping this community day in and day out. Uh, this uh, comes in here. Uh, it's anonymous. We don't have a name with it, but Dr. Stutz, is it safe to have the COVID booster shot and the flu shot at the same time? So Dr. Stutz, talk to us. If you got a Moderna, if you got a Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson, booster shots are going to be highly recommended. Talk to us about that, number one. And then number two, is it safe to get a booster shot and a flu shot at the same time? Yeah, so um, that uh, the, the booster shots were recommended for immunocompromised, and it sounds like the, the government is going to start recommending uh, booster shots, uh, you know, even uh, just for non-immunocompromised immunocompromised, uh, members of the community that have uh, been vaccinated already. And I can see their logic in that. Um, uh, you know, your immune system needs some occasional reminders um, to uh, continue producing antibodies to fight off whatever it is you want to fight want it to fight off. So. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, what was, sorry, what was the second question? And then, uh, is it okay to be able to get the booster shot and the flu shot at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, per personally, uh, at least, uh, medically speaking, I think it's probably perfectly safe to get both at the same time, but, um, you know, there, there's, there's one thought that, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to get a strong reaction to one or the other, it might be wise to separate them just so you know, which one of, of it was, uh, that, that caused the reaction. Um, so uh, yeah, you, you're 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 going to be uh, uh, you're going to be looking at two different vaccines. If you if you have a severe reaction to one or the other, which are rare but possible, um, then you're going to be wondering which one it was that, that you had a severe reaction to. Uh, Larry writes in, Doctor Stutz, uh, he's had COVID. Should he get a booster shot later this fall, uh, Doctor Stutz? Um, you know, without knowing more about uh, about his situation. Uh, uh, it's hard to really say, um, or about, you know, if he reacted to the first one. Um, uh, I think in general, it's going to come down to, uh, we're going to, we're going to have a yearly um, a vaccine, probably, 
uh, for um, for COVID, just like we do for influenza. And uh, you know, we've already seen uh, how how quickly uh, COVID can can mutate and change on us and escape uh, our vaccine coverage. So uh, undoubtedly, um, I'm going to be recommending at least yearly um, vaccine boosters uh, or new vaccines, right, um, as they as they get produced. And I think you know, the UCLA Geffen School of Medicine says that if an individual has had COVID, they would potentially have antibodies. And again, it's still the jury still out six to eight months, which is even if you do have if you have had COVID, Dr. Stutz. Uh, you should look to that booster or getting that full regimen, right, to better protect yourself. But I don't want to put words in your mouth. That's yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's a, that's another great, you know, uh, question um, to answer for everybody because that's been, um, you know, a topic of concern. You know, if you've had um, the virus, why should you get uh, uh, any vaccine at all? And the answer is that the um, the vaccine and the virus, they they both. Uh, produce different immune responses to different proteins. And so the virus is made up of a capsule of proteins and that's what our immune systems are tuned to fight against, foreign proteins. So, you know, you, you develop a certain uh, subset of antibodies uh, to fight against the, a uh, that are developed naturally against a natural infection. And you develop a, another different set of antibodies um, to, uh, when you get your vaccine. So um, all you're doing is adding more more weapons to your to your immune system's tool belt to fight against the virus. You're just adding additional coverage to it for additional proteins that might not have uh, instituted an immune reaction when you got the, the virus in the first place. Dr. Stutt saying that if you have had COVID, uh, you should definitely get that booster uh, as well as a potential full regimen uh, because those antibodies, even after you receive COVID, uh, simply won't last. So uh, it's important to get that vaccine. We don't, we don't, the answer is we don't know how long they last or how, how long they're effective for. So yeah, I, at the moment, I would recommend it. That's Dr. Sess, public health officer. We're going to ask for closing comments from uh, our two hardworking elected officials. That's uh, Chris Howard, the board of supervisors chair, as well as the mayor pro tem, Blake in in just a moment. But we're going to give our last uh, question to the CEO of Sutter Coast Hospital. And again, Mr. CEO, if you will pass on our deep, deep appreciation to your medical team who's working 24 seven to be able to keep this community healthy. We owe them a debt of gratitude. Um, by debt uh, writes in, uh, how is the hospital staff faring? So give us uh, what you see on a daily basis uh, in the ICU, in the hospital itself. Uh, Mitch Hanna, CEO. Uh, they're, they're tired. Uh, you know, many of them are pulling uh, double shifts and lots of overtime because of the fact that we're just uh, short staffed. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, some some staff out ill. Uh, but the community has been tremendous. Uh, yesterday, food was brought in from uh, Arts Barbecue. Today, from Marlowe's. This was all uh, through uh, not only the local small businesses, but through the um, Wild Rivers uh, Community Foundation. And uh, yeah. Over the weekend, there was a, uh, a, a group that showed up at the hospital and brought all sorts of food and goodies for the staff, and we've been putting that out for them. So they really appreciate the community support, and I, I do as well. I want to thank everybody for that. Thank you so much. That is the CEO of Center Coast Hospital, Mitch Hanna. And I got to tell you, this community comes together, especially in times of need, especially when we have challenges. There is nowhere else I would rather be than in Del Norte County when neighbors are in need because each of you rally. And that's what we're gonna do now. Uh, we're gonna rally to be able to keep our community safe and healthy, our loved ones safe and healthy. The best thing that you can do coming off of this town hall is to get vaccinated. Get vaccinated to be able to keep our healthcare system thriving, to be able to keep our families and friends safe. We're gonna go to final comments from the mayor pro tem, representing Crescent City City Council, and that's Blake Inscore. Mr. Inscore, thank you for your leadership. Thank you to the, please pass on our thanks to the mayor and to the city council as well. The floor is yours, closing comments. Thank you, Senator. I just wanna thank everyone, uh, Dr. Sutz especially, for all the information you've provided tonight. This is so important to our community. Uh, uh, Michiana, thank you so much for letting us know uh, what's going on at the hospital and, and letting the community understand the dynamics of, of just how serious the situation is. Um, I, I wanna take just a moment of personal privilege, a question that came up in the chat uh, regarding uh, our, our faith community. 
And, and I just, as, as a member of our faith community, I want to encourage our, our local congregations to be part of the solution. The Supreme Court absolutely gives us the right to continue to meet in our faith community, and we, we appreciate that. And we know for our spiritual and mental health that it is important that we continue to encourage one another, but we also need to be part of the solution. Uh, it, throughout our faith community this coming Sunday, I hope everybody's got masks on if you're going to meet inside. You, you have a responsibility uh, and, and to show the integrity uh, of what our faith community represents to abide by this mask mandate and support this community. Um, maybe we should meet outside if we can't do that and spread out, uh, but we need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And so uh, as, as a leader in our local faith community, as well as in, in civic government, uh, let's all do our part. Let's all work together for, for the common good right now and support our, our local uh, health officials and our medical workers who are working so hard uh, to take care of us. Um, so again, thank you, Senator, for, for being, uh, being willing to, to partner with us. And, and thank you to all the hardworking people out there who are just trying to do the best that they can. Um, but I believe we can do this. I believe in this community. And I think this community needs to believe in itself. Um, so thank you. Good night, everyone. Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for your work, your service uh, to the residents of Crescent City and, of course, to Del Norte County. Uh, and speaking of Del Norte County, we want to say thank you to Supervisor Chris Howard. He's the chair of the Board of Supervisors this year. Mr. Howard, thank you so much uh, for all of your work, sir, uh, during these really challenging times. Closing comments, please. Yeah. Senator, as you alluded to earlier, this community has been through many challenging times in the past, but it's not been challenged the way it has impacting so many lives throughout all our rural areas here. And by us coming together as we have tonight through your leadership, we have shown this community, I think, that we stand together united as leaders here in this community to send a very strong message. Not only that that message is sobering, but if we act effectively together, we could change our outcome. And our outcomes could be very positive. And we could do this not only for our future, but for our children. And so tonight, I would ask that you do your best to support Dr. Stutz and this mandate because it will be effective. We know that because we've done it for the last year and a half, and it has shown to be effective. Again, Senator McGuire, thank you again. And we will look forward to joining everyone here next week, Thursday. Thank you so much. That's Supervisor Chris Howard, Chair of the Board of Supervisors. And please pass on our thanks to the entire board, sir, uh, for all of their work uh, during this challenging time. We want to say a few thank yous, uh, folks who helped put this together here tonight. We want to say thank you to Sophia, Rebecca, and Lyles. We want to say thank you so much to the uh, Office of Emergency Services Manager. She oversees this for Del Norte County. That's Kimmy Scott. She has been working 24 seven uh, for this community. Thank you so much, Ms. Scott. We wanna say thank you to Melody uh, from Public Health as well. Uh, and we wanna say thank you to Sunny from the city for all of the work. And uh, of course, to Cindy Vosberg. Cindy has been the point for small business relief and recovery. Ms. Vosberg, thank you so much. Uh, and please thank the chamber as well. Uh, I just wanna end it right here. Our goal for tonight, one was to be able to be transparent. We wanted to be open. We wanted to be honest. And we wanted to let you know that all levels of government are working together to ensure that the residents, the patients of Del Norte County are going to get the services they need now and through every minute of this crisis. Uh, we are working together uh, each and every day, and we are lockstep. And the last piece I want to say is we need to thank the real heroes of this, and that's the medical staff, whether it's Dr. Stutz, the doctors, the nurses, the licensed vocational nurses, they're the ones that are on the hospital floor, delivering for our family members who are in need. And we are so incredibly grateful. Thank you to the Del Norte County Fire, De to the, the City Fire Department. We wanna say thank you, of course, to the Ambulance District for all of their work. We would not be here without each and every one of you, and you have been the ones that are working so incredibly hard over this past 18 months. I'll leave it as I started. This pandemic, it's not about politics. It's about the public's health. Our only fight, our only fight right now is with this virus, not with each other. 
we encourage you, please, we need you to go get vaccinated. Please wear your mask starting tomorrow morning when you're indoors. And we'll see you next Thursday, next Thursday, starting at six o'clock uh, here for our next community briefing. Until next time, stay strong, Dallin County. We're gonna get through this together. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.